Ladies and gentlemen, most welcome. It's Friday, February 17th, 12.30, on time. We start on time because we have a lot of people who are listening to us uh, from and watching us via the live stream. We are broadcasting live via the live stream and I'm also welcoming all our participants here in the room in the public square of the uh, uh, Munich Security Conference here at this famous hotel, the Bayerischer Hof. Thanks for joining us. The next 45 minutes, we are going to launch our report exclusively here with you. It is about Europe and the neighborhood. And you know that, you, that the neighborhood of the EU, there are three sub-regions, the Western Balkans, the Eastern Partnership, and the Southern Mediterranean, Middle East and North Africa. How strong really is the interconnectivity between the both regions? We will give you data and facts. My name is Christian Hanult. I am the expert for the Middle East and North Africa region, the southern uh, neighborhood of the European Union, uh, and a senior expert at Bertelsmann Stiftung. And with me is here Richard Grievenson. Richard Grievenson is a senior uh, economist. He has a specific additional regional expertise in the Western Balkans and the Eastern Partnership. And he's the deputy director of the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. And his colleagues at the Vienna Institute and my colleagues at uh, the European program of Bertelsmann Stiftung, we together worked for a couple of months to try to get data and facts to a quite emotional question. Do we still have strong economic, financial and social ties as European Union with our neighboring regions, with the Eastern Partnership region, with the Western Balkans, with Turkey, with Middle East, North Africa? Or did we lose ground economically, financially, socially lose ground against Russia, China, and the US. What's your feeling when we look for a country, for example, Armenia? You know, Armenia is a very important country in the Eastern Partnership. What do you think, economically, financially, who's stronger there? Russia, China, the US, or Europe? Oh, I wouldn't be an expert, but I would guess Russia. And uh, why do you think so? Oh, your geographical proximity and uh, links uh, leading up to the most recent conflict. Yes, you're correct. But also China and the EU are quite strong in Armenia, I learned. And uh, please, uh, what about you with Serbia? What do you think in Serbia, uh, in the Western Balkans, uh, who is stronger there economically and financially? China, Europe, US, Russia? By now, I would expect it's the EU. And why? Because of the strong ties we've developed over the last many years. Yes, you're right. It's incredible strong, the European influence there. And my lady, and uh, if we look to Turkey, Turkey is in a very strong geographical position between Europe and Asia. What do you think, economically, financially, the interconnectivity of Turkey with Europe stronger, or China, US, Russia? What does your feeling, or your estimation say, tells us? Europe. Europe. Okay, yes. Yeah, Europe is very, very strong. I, I just learned that also the foreign direct investment into Turkey is more than 50% from Europe. And, uh, and senior economists like Richard told me that it's really, you know, wondering why they are not already a member of the European Union. And let us go quite more west in the southern neighborhood. Morocco, for example. Uh, what do you think economically, financially, socially, interconnectivity of Morocco with China, Russia, US, EU? I think Morocco is quite close to the EU and the US, whereas in Algeria is probably more China and EU. Yes, you are right, because Morocco has also a free trade agreement with the US, so it's, uh, US is catching up and uh, EU is still strong. Yeah, so uh, Richard, please give us data, some facts, guide us through this uh, very interesting jungle of uh, estimations, and, uh, um, and afterwards we will have Q&A and interested to know about your personal estimations. Richard, please, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Christian. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here on behalf of uh, my institute, Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies, and also the Bertelsmann Stiftung. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of a very big team today. I have to see a lot of colleagues worked on this report. So I'll give you an overview of the main, the main things that came out of it. And we start with this idea, geoeconomic competition in our neighborhood, uh, and we include in this the, the southern neighborhood, the Eastern Partnership, Western Balkans, and Turkey. Geoeconomic competition has increased in the last 15 years. This is a region that matters hugely for us. What, 
happens there affects uh, also the EU uh, a lot, as we see at the moment as well. And that the EU has been, in many ways, much more reticent to use geoeconomics, to use the levers it has in this region versus competitors, rivals, partners, so US, China, uh, and, and Russia. So we start with this, this, this assumption. To live up to its geopolitical ambitions, the EU has to learn or be more willing to use geoeconomics uh, in this region. And to do that, to go into this, we basically did two things. What economic levers does the EU have? We wanted to quantify and investigate that uh, first, and then how can, it, how can it use them better? So the approach is the following. We quantify EU, Chinese, Russian, uh, and US interconnectedness with the EU neighborhood. We do this since 2007, because we start with the hypothesis 2008 was an inflection point, not only because of the financial crisis, but also geoeconomically. And this hypothesis was very much borne out uh, in the study we did. We look at five areas. We do the classic economic interconnectivity stuff, so trade and finance. But we also looked at technology knowledge exchange, infrastructure connectivity, and labor mobility. So we broadened it beyond the, the traditional uh, indicators. And then at the end, we have the fields of action. Uh, how can the EU build on its strengths, use its strengths more geoeconomically? How can it minimize or manage its, its weaknesses? And how should it deal with Russia, uh, China, uh, and, and the US in this region? So I start with the classics ones. I start with trade. And this just shows you exports as a share of the total to the EU. It's just an example, I, I should, but it's a very representative example of what we find in the study. The EU is in blue. The EU is the dominant trading partner for almost all of the neighborhood. Up to three quarters of all trade is with the, is with the EU uh, in, in some of these countries. So here the EU position is really very strong. There are exceptions. So you see a bit of red at the top. That's Russia, especially Belarus. Also Armenia, Georgia, which are a bit more mixed. You know, some China, some, some US, some, some Russia, some EU. And then in the southern neighborhood, there are countries where the US is important, uh, especially Israel and Jordan. But really the story here is the EU is the dominant really overwhelmingly dominant partner, economic uh, trade partner of this region. And I think considering some of the political noise that we see, the shares for countries that Christian highlighted, like Turkey and Serbia, that, uh, uh, that the EU has is, is really, really strong. And if we did FDI for Turkey, it would be, it would be even higher than that. The problem with this, or where the EU is not using this fully, is how this trade integration really manifests itself. What we find, even with the countries that have very deep trading arrangements with the EU, so DCFDA or SAA countries, almost all of them, even 10 years after the agreement was signed or longer, so here zero is the year of the agreement signed, there's one exception, North Macedonia, but otherwise they continue to run these really big trade deficits uh, with the EU. So. The trade integration is strong, but the countries are not getting everything out of it that they could. This is a very different picture to the EU member states of Central and Eastern Europe. It would look very, very, very different. And so what we think, what we read from this is the trade agreements as they are, they're not enough of a carrot to incentivize reforms and all the political alignment with the EU that we would, uh, we would like to see. So in terms of fields of action, what we propose here is firstly more access to the EU market, especially for countries that don't have the deep agreements. But also from this chart, we see that's not enough. Also helping countries to maximize this, whether that's technical assistance, whether that's support with industrial policy, whether that's more types of financing, I'll come on to that in, in further slides. A partnership approach to make sure that the standard setting, the regulation takes countries into account. Of course, meeting all the terms of the single market, for example, much more difficult for, for this region. Um, incentivizing more private investment here. It's a very important moment when we think about private investment because of nearshoring. So because of the pandemic, because of the war, supply chains are changing, they're in flux. That's a big opportunity for the Western Balkans and for the EU neighborhood to attract some of these investment and try to move up the value chain and integrate more into value chains, but the EU can do a lot to, to support that. And then to enforce high standards. So always here we want to push the idea of carrots, of offering more, you know, of incentivizing the region, but then also that it comes with the harsh conditional, harsh but stronger conditionality than is, is currently the case. So that was trade. The other sort of classic indicator of economic interconnectivity is finance. And here it's a very similar story, actually, in the sense that the EU is by far the dominant partner, no question, but it leaves a lot on the table. There's a lot more it could do, economic levers, which it is not using at the moment in this region. One example is the EU budget. So at the bottom, we have the EU member states of Central and Eastern Europe. How much as a share of their GDP 
they've got from the EU budget since 2004, up to 2018 this is. And you see in the case of Lithuania, for example, it's pretty much half of its GDP over this time. I mean, this has been a huge support for economic development, infrastructure upgrading especially, helps to attract better quality of FDI, all of these things. That's something the neighborhood doesn't get. Even the Western Balkans, which is much more, it gets much more than anybody else through the EPA funding, especially if we take out Kosovo, it's really not much more than 10% of GDP over a similar time period. So it's a very different level of budget support. And in the study, we did the numbers on this. The EU could make a huge difference by scaling up budget support for the neighborhood at very limited cost to the EU itself. You know, the impact on the EU budget would be, would be negligible. The other thing we looked at in finance is the monetary part. And here's a very interesting story about the, the cooperation and partnership with the US. Because we hear all the time, I mean, throughout my career, I've read these stories about the, you know, the dollar's days are over, the end of dollar dominance, et cetera. And it never happens. If it does happen, the transition is towards the euro. Because if you put the euro and the dollar together, it's pretty much all foreign currency reserves in all the countries of the neighborhood for which we have the data. It's a bit more dollar in the Eastern Partnership countries. It's more euro in the Western Balkans. Turkey is kind of 50-50. Uh, so the neighborhood, it's also more of a mixed picture. But the point is together, the, the, the collective West, let's say, and of course, if you add Swiss franc and sterling to this, you get that basically completes the hundred. And we've seen in the case of Russia with the freezing of Russian central bank assets, how, yes, we're in a multipolar world, but when it comes to finance, actually the collective West is still overwhelmingly dominant. And this is a lever which is probably could be used, uh, could be used more. So on finance, as I said, it's very much the same as for trade. You know, the EU has uh, a lot of power. It doesn't always use what it has. So it could increase budget support for the region. It could do more to fund connectivity and growth, enhancing projects in the region, especially with focus on the twin transitions, so energy and, and digital transitions. Again, the private capital, incentivizing more private capital in, into the region, really at the time of near, I mean, now is the time because of nearshoring, it's a big opportunity for the region. Again, the conditionality point is very important, so the inf incentives come with conditionality, and that's the economic lever part. And then strengthening the euro as a reserve currency to use what we've seen can be a very effective tool, uh, especially in partnership with, uh, with the US. The third area we looked at is technology and knowledge exchange. And here it's, I would say, a less positive picture for the EU, it's certainly if we go over time. And this is one of the examples where we see 2008 as rather an inflection point. So this shows, this is high tech imports from China as a share of total high tech imports to the neighborhood countries. The light blue is 2007, and the, the dark is, is 2021. You can see in 2007, China was a negligible player in most of these countries, certainly no threat to the EU. By the time we get to 2021, China is a quarter, third, even more than that in some countries. It start, we don't show it on this chart, the EU share, but it starts to overtake uh, the EU here. So this is a, a, an area of technological interconnectivity where the EU is losing out pretty fast uh, to, to China. So the fields of action on the knowledge and, and technology exchange, first of all, you know, there's a, the there's a question about EU competitiveness, EU technological competitiveness is a big topic that could be a session uh, on its own. But these data with China show a, a loss of, of competitiveness, or at least that's part of the story there. Integration uh, in digital markets, we see that happening in the Western Balkans uh, with the common regional market, but that of course can go further in the rest of the neighborhood. We have a section on, on patent laws. What, you know, why do so many companies from this region patent in the US and not in the EU? More could be done to simplify that. And we also see trends in that direction. More technology and scientific cooperation, higher education cooperation, and student exchange, Erasmus+. Plus. This part, these last parts, this is the strength of the EU at the moment in this area. This is where the EU is already very strong, but of course has to be maintained and, and expanded for the future generation uh, as well. The fourth area we look at is infrastructure, which in a way is a subset of finance, but it's so important we put it uh, on its own. And there's lots in the study, and it was a bit difficult to decide what to show here. But I think this, it shows a subset. It only shows Southeast Europe, Western Balkans, and Turkey, but it tells something about the broader story. This is Chinese infrastructure investment. Uh, 2007 to 14, so the first half of the period that we looked at, and then 2015 to 21, the, the, the second half. And you can see Chinese infrastructure investment in Southeast Europe tripled uh, over this period. 
Now, of course, there's also EU in infrastructure investment going on in this region, but you start to see in the numbers both that Chinese are a real competitor of the EU, at least in, in some countries, but also the problems that this can bring, whether it's about public procurement, whether it's about the standards of the green transition, and probably many people know the story of what happened uh, in Montenegro. So this is also, I think, something that's a negative thing from, from the EU uh, perspective. So what we propose here is first upping the infrastructure financing. The EBRD reminds us every year that this region has a major infrastructure deficit, infrastructure financing deficit, 10, 12, 14% of G GDP every year deficit. Um, that's a big difference to the EU member states uh, of, of Central and Eastern Europe. And that is a gap, it's a need that the Chinese are, are partly filling because the EU is not. And so the EU could, could do more there. Things are moving, but it could do more. Tie these investment plans to the green transition, do more in transport, which is a particular weakness and a bit of a barrier to economic development uh, in this region. Improve again, so I will mention now for the third time, I think nearshoring, getting more private investment or incent finding ways to incentivize private capital uh, uh, to come into this region as well. The final area, this is the final slide and I will conclude, um, is, is labor mobility. And really here there's a, a million things to, to say. Uh, Christian and I discussed what, what should we focus on. And I think the main message is this. We are, as the EU, very reliant on this region for labor mobility. You know, if you think about what, how would the Polish labor market function without Ukrainians, you know, uh, before the war, before the war started. Uh, and that will remain, the big development gap will remain, there will be this push-pull factors, uh, you know, we have labor shortages, we, we need workers from, from this region. What will happen in the future, though, is Oh, the only part of this region which will see working age population growth in the future is the southern neighborhood. So you see the dark blue bars are working age population change. In the Eastern Partnership countries, in the Western Balkans, populate, working age population growth will be negative. Only in the southern neighborhood will it grow. So yes, we will still need migrants from this region. Yes, they will still come. There will be reasons for them to come. But relatively much more will come from the southern neighborhood uh, in the future than, than the rest of the region. And that, of course, will also have uh, policy implications. I won't go through all of this, the fields of action, but the key point is we propose a partnership approach, a more planned approach that balances what we need, what the sending countries need, and of course the needs of uh, labor migrants themselves. So that was it. That was the whistle-stop tour of, of a, I would say, fairly big study. Uh, I will just sum up what the main messages are. So we, we framed this conclusion in the sense of carrots and sticks, this old formulation that everybody knows. It's a bit crude, I think, but the point is clear. Providing incentives, offering more, because clearly the results are not what we want at the moment, but equally using that opportunity to apply more conditionality and to demand change in a way that the EU wants to see. So on the carrots, more access to the EU market, uh, more technical assistance to help maximize that upside. Secondly, more budget support and more uh, investment in the region, more access to the EU budget, especially for the, for the candidate countries. And then thinking about how to crowd in private investment better because of the potential of nearshoring at the moment, but also because we know in the past there have often been very heroic assumptions about the crowding in of private investment, which haven't always uh, materialized. The second key area is a tight, tighter relationship, so this partnership approach on taking the neighborhood into account on standard setting, regulation, foreign policy alignment and, and migration, as, as I mentioned on the previous slide. More digital market integration and increased student exchange, which as I said is already a strength but is very important also for the future. The final part is then the sticks and using this opportunity, offering more, incentivizing more to apply more conditionality, tougher conditionality on reforms, standards, transparency, foreign policy alignment. If we think about the Western Balkan case, you know, the, the reform agenda has not gone in the way we want it to in the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, and by offering more, we can also demand more on the reform side and then strengthening the euro as a reserve currency and really in this financial area, using the partnership approach with the US as, as an economic lever. So I will stop there. And, and Richard, um, when you say that our data and facts are telling us that the economic, financial and social strengthness uh, of the European Union with all the neighboring regions, regions is so, so strong, even if they are facing more competition with China, less with Russia, and there's some, uh, you know, peer or rivalry with the US, 
Uh, what does this, in the light of the war of Russia against Ukraine, mean for EU integration strategies, for EU neighborhood strategies? What would you say when you sum that up? Well, I think, so certainly looking at it from an economic perspective or geoeconomic perspective, obviously the, the EU integration strategy now has to change. You know, with, with Ukraine uh, coming towards the EU on, on a formal EU accession process. I mean, just the scale of the size of the economy, the size of the agricultural sector, the development level also of Ukraine, it changes the game in terms of integration. I mean, we're talking about a much bigger group of, of countries now, a, a lot more people, a much bigger GDP uh, to bring into uh, the European Union. My sense is, and things already are going in this direction in the Western Balkans, I think, and there are many proposals on the table, is that even if we understand the politics is very difficult, and certainly with Ukraine, the politics of accession is going to be very difficult. We're looking at an accession process now which lasts decades. And that was the case before the war anyway. I mean, Poland, countries like that, their, their whole accession process lasted about eight years. North Macedonia has already lasted almost two decades. And that will be the case for the Western Balkans. And, you know, sorry to say, but almost I feel quite confident that that will be the case for Ukraine as well. I think what we can take from this study is that a lot more can be done in terms of economic integration ahead of accession than has been done in the past. And the justification for that is, well, we see things going in, in the wrong direction in some areas, but also that fully applying the old model when it, the accession process takes so much longer is a problem. And we see that you know, with, the, with the trade data that the countries run persistent deficits. They don't, because they don't get the big budget inflows, because they cannot improve their infrastructure in the same way as say, the Visegrad countries did, because they cannot attract the same level and quality of FDI to build up their export sectors. They suffer from particular brain drain. All of these things requires, I think, specific economic solutions ahead of accession. And there are proposals on the table uh, get, you know, the, the goal should be single market. Get all of the, the, the accession countries, the candidate countries, into the single market as quickly as possible, of course, when they meet the criteria, but splitting that away from the, the rest of the accession process. Mm -hmm. Now, the politics of that is not for me to comment on. But, but, in, uh, but increasing the joint economic uh, potential. Yeah, I yeah? think what, what you see from this trade deficit mm -hmm. chart is that it's an incomplete model of integration. It's mm -hmm. not the model of integration that uh, Poland or Czech Republic or Hungary mm -hmm. or Slovenia had or the Baltic states. Um, and this could be, uh, there, as, as I've outlined, there are things that could be done to, to change this. Mm -hmm. I am happy also to open up the discussion. Please, uh, please tell me if you want to have a, have a um, remark or a question. Uh, but first of all, I would like to ask, is there an American, an American with us? Okay. <laughs> because I would like to know, because we say, you know, US and, and, and EU should be, uh, in, connect their strength str strongly, economically and financially. What do you as an American expect from the EU to do? Well, I'm a very pro-EU American, so maybe I'm not a typical person to ask, but uh, I'm Andy Morovchek from Princeton University. Um, uh, actually, I think they're complementary. The Americans aren't very good at this kind of economic stuff and don't have a lot of assets on the ground compared to Europe in Eastern Europe so, or, or the neighborhood generally. So um, I think you should count on the Americans for other things like delivering arms to Ukraine and count on the Europeans to deal with this. My question to you is sort of a more policy question. So when you're thinking about how medium term or long term to maximize the positive externalities of this kind of economic activity, what do you think the trade-off should be in EU policy between conditionality and simply doing things to open the spigot and let it flow? And where do you think the bottlenecks and political problems arise there? Thank you, Richard. Yeah, excellent question. I mean, it's the core question in a way, and that's what we try to you know, combine with this carrot stick thing at, at the end. I think that if we take the Western Balkans as a concrete example, because it's the closest, it's further along the, the path to the EU, what we've seen in the last 15 years is that the accession momentum has basically stopped. So the, the, the belief in the EU accession process has faded a lot. So the, there's a feeling that the carrots have not been there. It hasn't, as I said, had the budget inflows, all, all of these things. And what we see then on the, on the other side of that is that the reform pro process has, has flagged. And especially Serbia, which is in a way the key to the whole region, has gone backwards. Mm. And so I think the two things have to go together. I mean, I think it, it would be certainly dangerous, which I think is implied in your question, to basically offer a lot more and that's it, you know, to, to give a lot more carrots without extracting something in return. But I think what we've seen also with, 
with previous accession rounds, I mean, the real reforms, like what we want to see in, in these countries is real institutional reforms. We want them to, to develop, uh, to reach a higher level of economic development also by reforms. Yeah, key. And we've seen, you know, the, the, what the last 30 years or so teaches us is the, the real reforms are most likely to happen in the years immediately before accession. When it's clear that it, it's coming, everybody believes in it, and, and the foreign investors start to pile in then as well. You know, that's when you get the really the big projects start to arrive. Uh, and that's when the EU has the most leverage. But it, the, 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 the prospect has to be really credible, I think. And that's what's been missing in, in the Western Balkans. So it's, it's, it's both things, but I think if we are, you know, all of this is difficult. Like these reforms are really tough, but the best chance of them happening is the, the credibility and the leverage of a real EU accession process, which is coming down the line and people believe in. And promoting rule of law is one of the most important issues when you want to strengthen institutions also in the neighborhood. You know, when you have rule of law, also migration populations, you know, in Europe, uh, invest more in their home countries when they know there is there are there, there are strong institutions and 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 a stronger sense of rule of law. Uh, my lady, you wanted to you had a question. Please introduce. Thank you very much. My name is Lynn Kwok, and I'm from the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Um, I had two questions on the um, on your on your point about um, how you know offering more incentives could also allow the EU to impose more conditionality. Um, you know, I think the the um, how we've seen China operate is that basically it has been able to offer more without conditionality. So how will you know the the attempt to impose greater conditionality actually helped the EU in terms of winning the strategic, the broader strategic game. Um, second, um, you talked about the need uh, to um, uh, offer up incentives to the private sector to crowd in more financing. If I look at um, my part of the world, the Indo-Pacific or, South or Southeast Asia, um, you know, the U.S. hasn't been particularly successful in offering private sector incentives to crowd in more financing because some of the projects are not particularly, um, uh, they're, they're very risky and also they're not particularly economically viable. So just offering more private sector incentives isn't going to in incentivize anything if it's not an economically viable project, it's just not. Um, so is the EU, through its global gateway project, been more successful in that respect? Richard. No, also very good questions. Um, on the, uh, let, let me start with the second one actually. The, so um, yeah, I think that, that, so there are two elements of this. I, what I think I was probably emphasizing more in the presentation is, is FDI investment, I, I, I mean, as well as infrastructure investment. So because of this moment of nearshoring and, and, and changes in supply chains, I think what we see is again, the, like the credibility of the EU accession process is so important because the really big FDI started to arrive in um, in the Visegrad countries, say, in the years immediately before uh, accession. So I think in that sense, the, as long as countries are heading towards the EU, meeting the terms they're key, doing the reforms, improving infrastructure, all of these kind of things, uh, the private investors will go there. You know, the, we, we have surveys on this and private investors are interested in this region. I mean, there, there, there is an appetite to shorten supply chains, you know, mm. bring investment back and go into this region. So I think as long as we can, you know, get this reform momentum, get this process back on track, the FDI will come. I think that that, that, that will come. On the infrastructure side, uh, it's, of, you're right, of course. I mean, I think in a way the Chinese are partly doing the EU's job for it now. I mean, because what happened in Montenegro, what happened with Lithuania, I mean, in the, in the whole region, there's a turn a bit more, much more skepticism, I think, about Chinese investment uh, than there was in the past. And I think ultimately that shows, I mean, the EU has much more to offer this region. And, it, you know, even if, yes, the Chinese don't apply conditionality. In terms of I mean, a broader development strategy and meeting the needs of what these countries really need, like what kind of infrastructure do the countries need, not what kind of infrastructure do the Chinese want to build there, then the EU is again a much better partner in that sense. So I think that um, the EU, there's much more that can be done here, I think, um, by, by the EU. That's what I want to emphasize. Mm -hmm. um, and I mm -hmm. think that as we head into this it, it seems like we are already in this era of much bigger geoeconomic competition anyway, globally. 
and then this changing attitude towards China, which is very clear, I think, in the reason. Not in every country, not in Serbia, for example. Um, that also is plays in, rather in the EU's favour and should make EU projects more attractive, but the EU has to want to do mm -hmm. them as well. Mm -hmm. And there's also the strong joint potential and, uh, and, and, and possibility for stronger partnership across the Mediterranean when we look into the southern neighbourhood with the digital and especially the green, uh, uh, the, um, the green economy. Yeah, creating jointly uh, um, um, uh, CO2 neutral um, energy, uh, not just to export it to Europe, but to produce it in our neighboring countries in the south so, they, so that they produce uh, uh, green and uh, in, in a green way their products so that both sides of the Mediterranean can, uh, can profit from, from green partnerships and of course of the di digitalization in order to, to, uh, to increase the capacity of uh, IT and communication technology. There was a question from, U from our Ukrainian colleague and then here, please. Thank, thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Andrei Buzarov. I'm international uh, journalist from Ukraine and PhD researcher. I have one simple question. I absolutely agree with you when you was uh, speaking about the necessity of reforming the, uh, the neighborhood policy of European Union. But what concrete formats or configuration you see in the nearest year or years, uh, uh, the neighborhood with Ukraine? Because if the war uh, will continue, it's very, very high probability it will continue. So what will be next step? Because five million Ukrainians, they already integrated in the community of European Union, but they are not integrated in the economy of European Union. So how to distinguish political and economic steps? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Richard, will you well, answer? Very important question. I mean, Ukraine is obviously going to play a very particular role in the next stage of European integration. It's a very particular case. Um, I think that, well, uh, of course, everything depends on the war. You know, how long will the war last? How, how will it end? Um, I think that um, there are a number of things which are clear in Ukraine, but that we can say already. One is that the demographic picture is, is d disastrous, I would say, unfortunately, you know, as, you, as you point out. So many people have left. The longer the war goes on, the longer people stay. They are unlikely or less and less likely to go back. Children go to school, mm -hmm. people find jobs, etc. cetera. Um, there's also this huge, within Ukraine, this huge um, industrial change going on. Of course, already in 2014, a lot of the big industry was lost or, or, or damaged, even more so now. And so these sectors which are stronger in the center and the west of the country, or agriculture of course, but also the IT sector and renewable energy, these will become more important. And that is what will drive the next phase of European integration with, uh, with Ukraine. Um, we will see you know, deep, much deep integration with countries like uh, Poland, and it's really a complete uh, restructuring of the economy. How it works in terms of the formal EU accession process, I, I don't know. I mean, we have a new methodology anyway. We have the new methodology since 2020. I mean, my impression is we're going in the direction of this phased approach, you know, this fa phased enlargement uh, approach. And certainly economically, that is important, I think. And, and my, my, so my opinion, I think I already said it, um, much, uh, there will have to be a deeper economic integration ahead of accession because accession takes uh, so much longer. And we see the, imp the implications of that in the Western Balkans and Ukraine, the, the same thing uh, will happen to Ukraine. So Ukraine will be undergoing internally this big, well already is, this big structural economic change. And then we'll be integrating with Europe as part of this new, the, as, part of this, uh, as part of this change. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, so a maximum economic integration, and, and there are proposals, you know, get Ukraine into the single market by 2030, by 2035, all of these things are on the table. Uh, I think that's the way it will go. And we are looking, you know, geo-economically at a much harder divide in Europe now. That's clear, you know, there's going to be a, a, the Russia, and there's going to be a very, very hard divide. Most of Ukraine, we think, we hope, will be on, 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 the, on the EU side of that. Um, and it's going to be much more integrated and it will be a wrenching change for the economy. The structural change will, will be, it will create a lot of winners, a lot of losers. You know, this, we're doing work now in, at my institute on that uh, as well. And um, it will be a big thing for the European economy as well because of the size of Ukraine. I have uh, three further questions. I will take all of them. Please introduce yourself and, uh, and uh, tell what's on your heart, please. 
Uh, uh, Michael Kovrig, I'm Senior Advisor for Asia with the International Crisis Group. Uh, I see you have a lot of really interesting geoeconomic recommendations on ways forward for countries in the periphery of the EU, but I'm, I'm curious whether you think any of these geoeconomic tools can also be used uh, with those EU members that have been engaging in more democratic backsliding, let's say. I'm thinking since you're in Vienna, particularly of your neighbor to the east, Hungary. Um, to what extent uh, can the EU also shore up its internal periphery, if you will, using these measures? Thank you. And uh, Alexander Bursch, uh, I'm chief economist at Deloitte, and I have a question about nearshoring. So you mentioned nearshoring quite a few times, and I mean there are obviously many hopes in the region to get back production, to get more investment. However, I'm on the impression that companies these days are looking more to a sort of revised Asia strategy. Many are looking uh, to the US. So I'm wondering, I mean, what can be done politically to encourage more reshoring or nearshoring uh, into that region? Uh, Brendan Sims, um, director of the Center for Geopolitics in Cambridge. My question is, is parochial, I'm afraid. Um, the EU has acquired a new neighbor uh, uh, to the Northwest, uh, but do you see any room for collaboration uh, between the EU and the United Kingdom in the kind of activities you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Richard? All good questions. Know, yes. It's difficult to answer. Uh, good to study. Good answer, questions. <laughs> answer quickly. Um, on Hungary, well, I think this. Is, so, I mentioned before. I mean, if you look in the in the data on when when do positive reforms happen, it tends to be the years immediately before accession. That's when the leverage is. As we see with Hungary, it's much much uh, harder afterwards. I mean, I think that. I mean, it's just a personal view. I mean, I, I think the you know, the the conditionality should be applied much. More, much in a much tougher way, also uh, within the EU uh, on this. I mean, um, but I mean that's 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 ultimately a political question, which I, I find uh, very hard to answer. I think, you know, just from an economic side, the Hungarians have found this niche where they have a few big German foreign invest investors. They're excellent at absorbing money from the EU budget, and it's a it's a economic model that's worked pretty well. It's been one of the fastest growing economies in Europe until recently. Now it's doing pretty badly. Um, but it ultimately, no, it's, it's, a, it is benef it's economically benefiting a lot. And I think, so, you know, it seems we're going, we are going now in this direction of harder conditionality with Hungary, and I guess that's, that's the way to go. Um, on nearshoring, um, so, well, I think firstly, it's, it is a bit overplayed, especially for the EU members of Central and Eastern Europe, because I doubt it's going to be a complete game changer for a country like Slovakia, where industry is already so big. I think for the Western Balkans and other parts of the neighborhood, it's more realistic because the economies are so small, because they have such a low level of FDI at the moment, or at least low quality, you know, very little integration into, into global value chains. Um, if you, we, we have done surveys on this. I mean, if you, like if you ask foreign investors, what, what, why wouldn't they go to that region? It's the, the politics, so the worries about the, especially you know, Serbia, Kosovo, and what's within, going on within Bosnia. Uh, it's the reforms, uh, so especially governance stuff, and it's a lack of it, not believing fully in the EU accession process. Um, and I mean, the EU can positively influence all of those things, I would say, so that would be, that, that would be the way to go on, on that. Um, on the UK, um, well, Many, th many things that I could say here. Um, I mean, what, what I said, so, uh, I mean, working on this region, I think the impression I got, especially straight after Brexit, is that in the Western Balkans, it was felt as a great loss. You know, there was a sense the UK was an important country within the EU in, in terms of, from a Western Balkan uh, perspective. And I guess there is still like a lot of appetite to have the UK involved in, if the UK wants to be involved. I mean, economically though, I mean, the UK is not an especially important player really in, in any of this region. You know, if, we, if we go to specific countries, I mean, Germany is by far the most important. Italy tends to be pretty important in, in Southeast Europe and, and even Austria is quite a small economy, but it also has a, has a pretty la high level of, uh, of importance. I mean, I guess the, the role of the UK in this future integration is that, I mean, there's going to be some kind of outer ring of countries which are not in the EU and not going towards the EU. 
Um, in some ways, the UK represents some of the same challenges as, as Turkey, probably. I mean, my opinion is the UK will end up something like Switzerland or Norway, you know, very closely economically integrated, but not with, within the EU. But what that means for the geoeconomics, uh, I'm not sure. But for the geopolitical uh, challenges, we still need very, very strong and close cooperation with Great Britain. And if you ask me personally, I miss Britain in the EU. Please come back. <laughs> and uh, um, yes, so further questions? Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Yassine Zaitri. Uh, I lead our cybersecurity business for public sector in Europe for Accenture. And I, I have one comment and one, qu one question. So, uh, uh, you know, I think we talked about carrot and stick. So I think we already discussed about Hungary. Uh, my feeling is that unless we're able to actually uh, create conditionality within European Union and actually use the stick mm -hmm. more effectively within EU, I think that we'll have countries like Serbia who are acting like they are acting currently. And I think that is that is having a you know negative effect also for the for the processes for the countries that want to be members. And then the second point I wanted to make, and I think there was a question about nearshoring. I actually see it very differently. You know, we are one of the largest outsourcing companies in the world uh, on, on IT, and we see, especially after certain EU regulations. We see a huge demand on nearshoring within the European Union, particularly in the Baltics and Eastern Europe. And what we see also is that the cost increase in, in actually in Asia Pacific, in India, for example, is actually changing the spectrum significantly. So there's going to be more and more work done uh, within, let's say, low, more low cost uh, areas of Europe. Thank you for your question, Richard. Yeah, no, so, I mean, what I wanted to say, so I was really thinking about manufacturing first. Mm. And in that sense, I don't see it as a game changer for the manufacturing powerhouses of, of Central Europe because they're so strong anyway. And I think there's this additional problem now of, of energy prices. You know, we we're going to have energy prices permanently higher in Europe for a while than historically. And, there, and this is what I wanted to say to your question, which I forgot as well. Um, there, I mean, there's this danger of far shoring in, in manufacturing, of moving production out of Europe to, to, places where, to places where energy is cheaper. In other sectors, certainly, I mean, I still think though the region, so Central and Eastern Europe in general, my opinion, is still has a huge economic potential and is very interesting to foreign investors. But what I really, what, all I really wanted to say, uh, you know, not to be, didn't want to be negative about Central Europe, just that probably it's the smaller economies, places like the Western Balkans, Moldova, where it could really be a game changer. Because if you have 40% of German firms considering changing supply chains, 40% of German firms abroad considering changing supply chains, for really small economies in Southeast and Eastern Europe, that is potentially a game changer. Yes, I hope we could raise the interest in our study. And even if we talk about sticks and carrots, the title of our study is Keeping Friends Closer. We want all our sub-region, neighboring sub-regions being our close friends. Not just Eastern Partnership and the Western Balkans, also Turkey and uh, North Africa and the Middle East. And the societies are so close and we learned that especially the exchange of students, uh, um, those who, who want to uh, educate new laborers uh, and jobs, that, they, that the inter interconnection and the, uh, the interchange with people is a very strong asset for the future. Uh, please, um, this is an ex ex exclusive launch of our study. Please take a copy of you. Those who are in the live stream, you can go on the website of the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies and Bertelsmann Stiftung, and you will find all information and links uh, around the study and the study itself. Thanks for your interest, and uh, we are looking forward to all feedback regarding the findings of the study, and uh, enjoy your time here at the Munich Security Conference. Thanks to everybody who helped us here with techniques and organizational support for having the public square here uh, organized. Thank you so much, and have a good day.